Good morning. This is the Morning History Show for May 29th, 2023. I'm Dr. Sean Munger. I'm a historian, author, podcaster, and teacher. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, obviously, here. Uh, I teach history courses online and in person. Today's stories involve an ancient Egyptian mummy workshop, a very, very interesting account of the links between medieval Ireland and Constantinople, or Byzantine Empire, and also on the theme of Constantinople, some thoughts on the anniversary of the fall of the city to the Ottoman Turks today is that anniversary. So thanks to those who've listened so far. This show is still in its experimental early phase. This is the most fragile part of a podcast life cycle. Still trying to find the footing and exactly what we're doing and how it's working and that kind of thing. But I do thank everyone who's listened so far. I featured the podcast. There's an article on my blog, The Garden of Memory. That's gardenofmemory.net. It's kind of my main blog these days. So I did focus uh, a, an article on it. And also thanks very much to the folks on Mastodon who are spreading the link for the show. So thanks very much. Okay, so our first story for today, this is being reported in many, many places. The government of Egypt announced new discoveries of ancient Egyptian artifacts and structures at the Saqqara Necropolis. This is the former Egyptian, ancient Egyptian capital of Memphis. And they said that they found two embalming workshops where mummies were prepared for burial, both human and animal mummies, and apparently some animal mummies have also been found. These workshops were complete with stone beds where the corpses were laid out uh, to be prepared to be to be mummified. And they said they also found two tombs of priests. So the mummy workshops date from the 30th dynasty, and that's fairly late in ancient Egyptian history. 380 to 343 BCE are the traditional dates we put on the 30th dynasty, and that dynasty ended with the invasion of the Persian king Artaxerxes. And then after, shortly after that came the Ptolemaic period. This is when Egypt was conquered by the Macedonians, Alexander the Great, who put uh, Greeks on the throne. He put his, actually his historian, uh, Ptolemy Soter, on the throne of Egypt. And that became the uh, uh, Macedonian or the Greek, the the Ptolemaic dynasty, excuse me, Macedonian Greeks. And Cleopatra, the last ancient Egyptian ruler, was from that dynasty. So the 30th dynasty is the last native dynasty of Egypt. It was under foreign domination after that. So mummy workshops were set up fairly close to the sites of ancient Egyptian burials. There were very, very elaborate preparations for being mummified, uh, scraping out the organs and treating bodies with natron salt and other chemicals, that sort of thing, preserving the organs in jars. Fairly gruesome procedure. You can read a lot about it. Uh, But this obviously was a very, very long tradition in ancient Egypt. Thousands of years they did this. But actually, for as practiced as they were at it, mummification was successful, or more or less successful, at preserving the deceased only about half the time. A lot of ancient Egyptian mummies just kind of crumble into dust at the slightest touch. I have a, uh, talk about the Garden of Memory, I put an article on it recently uh, called uh, Ancient Egypt's Chamber of Horrors, KV35, KV. Uh, for the uh, abbreviation Valley of the Kings. This was a mysterious chamber discovered in 1898, which had a whole bunch of Egyptian mummies in it and some pretty horrifying discoveries. This is a total digression, but it is on my blog, gardenofmemory.net, if you're interested. So I have been doing some stuff with ancient Egypt lately. So anyway, the tombs that were found, we're back to Saqqara here, the, the today's uh, discovery. The tombs found are much older, one was from a priest called He, I'm sorry, Nehesut Ba, who lived in the fifth dynasty, about 2300 BCE. That's very, very early period. And the other was a priest called Menkeber from about the 14th century BCE. So we've got a kind of a patchwork of discoveries here. There's been a lot of discoveries in Saqqara in recent years. The modern government of Egypt is fairly desperate to revive tourism as a major sector of their economy. 
This is following, it was depressed following the 2011 Arab Spring and then again during the COVID pandemic. So they're trying to recover from that. And they've been sending teams of archaeologists to old sites to try to find new, new discoveries. And some in the archaeology community have criticized this practice, accusing the government of moving too fast and, and just kind of uh, trying to grab press headlines like this one uh, to boost tourism without really doing the, the, the you know, real deep work to preserve these sites the way they should be preserved. Uh, it is true Egypt wants to boost, uh, I saw some numbers that they want to boost their tourist influx by 25 to 30 percent a year which is a staggering number. And for decades, there's been criticism of Egypt's attitude toward tourism. Large numbers of tourists de tend to degrade ancient sites. Tutankhamun's tomb, for example, the number one tourist attraction, is degrading rapidly, mainly because of the huge numbers of people coming to see it. But on the other hand, this criticism is sort of paternalistic. It's kind of rooted in kind of, you know, Western powers telling non-Western powers what to do with their own heritage. These are Egypt sites and artifacts, and it can boost, you know, if it could boost their economy, I absolutely see the argument for doing that, you know, use it to the hilt if they can. But definitely from this story, you can tell that there's a publicity strategy here because I found this story on numerous news sites. It originated with press releases from the Egyptian government uh, the one, the specific story that I link in the description is from Al Jazeera. And I chose that one because it includes a lot of photos of what they uncovered. And they're pretty interesting. So if you want to see those, go to the link in the description and you'll see some pretty, pretty cool stuff. All right. So second story is really interesting. And it comes from an outfit called the Impartial Reporter, which is an Irish publication. And it's an article by a writer and blogger, Barney Devine, uh, or De Devine, uh, D-E-V-I-N-E. -E. It's not news exactly, but it's a story about the connections between medieval Ireland and the Byzantine Empire. Specifically, Devine is writing about an ancient uh, or medieval manuscript called the Annals of Ulster, which is one of the most important sources that we have about medieval Ireland. This is a huge wealth of historical data. It's a chronicle of Irish history from the year 431 to the year 1540. So it's obviously just a staggering amount of information. And Divine was, uh, went to the chronicle, the Annals of Ulster, looking for references to Byzantium. He says he was, he was going to Constantinople and visited the walls, for example. Uh, but he, he went looking for references to Byzantium in the chronicle, and there are some. So, for example, there's a line in the Annals of Ulster, and it says, quote, 720 AD, Theodore reigned one year, end quote. Now, this refers to the emperor more commonly known as Theodosius III. The date is not exactly precise because we think Theodosius reigned from 715 to 717, just before the great Saracen invasion, um, right when Leo III came to the throne. That's I know a lot about that period because of the novel I wrote 11 years ago now called Zombies of Byzantium, which takes place at the backdrop of that event. So it's out of print, unfortunately. Anyway, um, another much earlier reference to Byzantium is in the Annals of Ulster. It's from 448, and it says, quote, Several walls of the imperial city of Constantinople had been freshly rebuilt with masonry, and 57 towers collapsed as a result of a violent earthquake which prevailed in various places, end quote. So recall, this is being written in Northern Ireland in the Middle Ages. And the point is that it's demonstration of how cosmopolitan medieval Europe was. There was commerce and social intercourse going on all the time. References to what's happening in the Eastern Roman Empire, that's Byzantium, is part of the view of the world that's being recorded by bishops in Ulster. And, and that really is kind of a fascinating thing. Contact between the British Isles and Byzantium was not unknown, and thus Ireland and Byzantium were connected too, obviously. Um, the Norse had raided and had a lot of contact with Ireland in this period, in the, the uh, years before, I think the Battle of Clontarp was 1014, if I recall correctly, that that was kind of the, when the Irish sort of ended 
uh, Viking incursions into into Ireland. But so a couple centuries before that, and then sort of about around that time and a little bit after it, uh, Norse later went to Constantinople as mercenaries. This was the famous Varangian Guard, who served as the emperor's the kind of a Praetorian Guard, for lack of a better term. A divine references this, and he, in fact, he he talks about the famous graffiti in Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, written in Norse runes by one of these guards. I would love to see that. I've never been to Turkey, but I would love to see that. So I make this point to my medieval history students all the time, my seventh graders. The world of the Middle Ages was interconnected, not isolated. And this is why I emphasize the Silk Road so much in, uh, in my teaching. Apparently, the last reference to Byzantine emperors in the annals of Ulster is around the year 800. There's nothing after that. Uh, but this article, this particular article in the Impartial Reporter, is part of a blog series by Barney Devine called Notes from the Field, which is real interesting to browse. Links in the description both to the specific article I'm talking about and then also to his blog where he goes around to various places um, and has these sorts of historical thoughts, you might say. Pretty interesting. All right, final point for today, not a news article, but an anniversary. I telegraphed it at the beginning of the episode. This also involves Byzantium. So today, May 29th, is the 570th anniversary of the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. That event gets my vote for the most important single event of the last 1,000 years. So I feel like I'd be remiss in not observing it. The Byzantine Empire was on its last legs by 1453. Uh, it had been sacked in 1204 by the Western Crusaders. That was during the Fourth Crusade. And Constantinople, the richest city in the world at that time, had been looted mercilessly during that conflict. Uh, Byzantine rule was restored in the Latins, as, as it was called the Latin Empire, ruled uh, a little bit during the 1200s, and then Byzantine rule restored in 1261 by the Paleologist dynasty. But the empire was much smaller, much, much poorer, and much weaker in that late period, the Paleologian period. Their great enemy was the rising Ottoman Empire, which had its sights on Constantinople. So after numerous sieges by various Ottoman sultans, they tried over and over again to reduce Constantinople. It was finally Mehmet II. He was only 21 at the time who finally brought it off. Uh, he laid siege to Constantinople for 55 days in the spring of 1453, beginning April 6th. The Byzantine emperor was at that time Constantine the 11th Paleologist. And really at that time, the whole empire was down to the city of Constantinople and a few other non-contiguous little pieces, such as what they called the Moria, which is now in the modern nation of Greece. Mistra was the, uh, the big area there. And Constantinople had actually been depopulated. People talk about it at that time that there were, you know, buildings surrounded by huge tracts of, of fallow, you know, former farmland because uh, most of the population had left. So even inside the walls, uh, there was really not much going on. Anyway, uh, the final assault, the, the story of the siege is, is epic, uh, but the final assault got going about 1.30 in the morning. On May 29th, a Tuesday, the Janissaries were the main vanguard of Mehmet's forces. And the first breach in the walls, of course, the huge uh, masonry defenses of Constantinople, which had been the city's primary defensive strategy for centuries. But the first breach was when Ottoman troops made their way through the Great Walls through a tiny wooden gate called the Kerkoporta, uh, which translates to the Circus Gate which had been mistakenly left open by the defenders after a reconnaissance foray. And we're not sure exactly the location of the Kirko Porta. We know kind of where it was, but nothing remains of it today, unfortunately. Emperor Constantine XI was last seen alive, charging into a horde of Janissaries. And it's not known for sure what happened to his body. Uh, there are reports that he was beheaded and his head brought to the Sultan, but those are probably false. There's, there's no real evidence that that happened. But the fall of Constantinople was important because it resulted in the reorientation of the whole Western world. It indirectly sparked the Age of Discovery for complicated reasons. The Silk Road declined after 
1453, the Ottoman Empire rose as a major power, so it had a lot of effects. And it was also kind of the last gasp of the medieval world, and the knowledge that trickled out of fallen Constantinople to the west, you know, the books and, and such that, that a few of the refugees brought, principally to Italy, may have had a hand in the Italian Renaissance. So that's not a slam dunk, but there's some evidence to support that. This subject, Fall of Constantinople, is a bit of a perilous topic because it's been weaponized in modern times. Uh, Turkish nationalists often frame this event, not surprisingly, in nationalistic terms. Uh, I used to, I, I founded the, I'm not on Twitter anymore, but I founded back in, way back in 2009, the Cry for Byzantium Twitter feed, which presented Byzantine history. Um, one tweet at a time, and I would dread the anniversary of May 29th because Turkish nationalists would come out of the woodwork and pile on with insults and harassment and that sort of thing uh, based on, again, weaponizing this event. A little bit less common, but Greek nationalists and Christian nationalists have also sought to weaponize the fall of Constantinople. A, a common narrative of the Greek War of Independence in the 1820s uh, continually rehashed this and involved the restoration of the Byzantine Empire from the Turks, that idea as if that was possible. Um, there were even some romantic legends uh, spun during this period. Again, we're talking 1820s that Constantine XI was still alive in some sort of suspended animation waiting for the Christian retaking of Constantinople to wake up from uh, from his 500-year coma. I don't know, kind of like Khan in Star Trek. I'm, I'm not sure how that works. Anyway, I, I do not have a nationalistic take on the fall of Constantinople, uh, but it's an event that has long interested me, and it is super important in world history. Uh, the best recent book on the subject, most readable recent book, is Roger Crowley's 2005 book, simply titled 1453, which I highly recommend. Okay, well, that's all for today. So thanks very much for listening to the Morning History Show, and I hope you have a great Memorial Day. Today is Memorial Day in the United States. So uh, thanks to all of our uh, veterans. Uh, and please tell uh, friends about this show if you like it, and uh, we'll come back to it uh, sometime soon. So we'll have more for you in a couple days. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.